Very good job. All right, as the as council packs up there and new council moves up to their respective tables, uh, we will now take up 18 20 32 Charles Wright et al. versus Barbara Ann Christensen individually and as trustee. And again, council, take your time getting settled in, but once you are, please let me know how much time you would like to have in rebuttal for the appellant. Council, how much time would you like to have in rebuttal? Uh, Your Honor, uh, five minutes for rebuttal. Okay. Please. Whenever you're ready, I'll start the clock. Thank you. May it please the court. My name is Alex Douglas with Sheffield Lohman, and I represent the appellants, Chuck Wright, Mike Sullivan, and uh, Tom Sullivan. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chuck Wright is in the courtroom here t with me today. Council, did the trustee use property appraiser values uh, when valuing the properties, or did she come up with her own value based upon her being a broker? In, the, in 1997, when she uh, took over, or no. when, in, 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 in the 2015. In, in 2015, she said she used the property appraiser's values. Our expert said that those well, no, values were so not. The reason I ask is because you don't mention that in your initial brief, but then you, you do say that you, you make the assertion in the reply brief that she used the property appraiser's uh, valuations. That's correct. But you didn't give us a site. And I spent a lot of time looking for that. Uh, I eventually think I found it, but, but could you sort of expound on that? I mean, usually we, we need sites to the record when yes, you make factual Honor. assertions. Y yes, it was an absolute. I think it's, it's, it's fully admitted, um, and we'll be glad to supplement uh, the, the record with the correct site. It's 874, right? Okay. I think that's right, Your Honor. Uh, Barbara Christensen testified that... So my question is, is what, what did she do? Did she use her own opinion for the value, or did she use the property appraiser's assessment? My understanding of her testimony is that she used a property appraiser's value. Mr. Roper, our expert, testified that property appraiser's value are well known to be mass market values that are significantly undervalued. In fact, um, she used an independent broker's opinion in 1997 when she established the values why she then decided just to go off of property appraiser's values uh, 18 years later, we believe is part of her self-dealing because she changed the deal that she had told the beneficiaries. She told the beneficiaries the six figures that they put into capital improvements and repairs, hundreds of thousands of dollars, improving these eight rental properties we all will benefit at the end. All our boats will rise because when we sell the property, everyone will reap the benefits. Council, what did the trial court, what was, you know, when you're reading the trial court's judgment on this issue, uh, the, the, uh, the part about the valuation, um, is that a finding that the value, regardless of how the trustee got to it, but is there a finding that the value is, is a reasonable number was it was was reasonable the the um, trial court certainly doesn't use the term reasonable right but the, the, that's right the the tr trial court found that the expert uh, testimony of mr. Durango was more credible than that of mr. Roper however as we point out in the, as we pointed out in the trial court and point, pointed out in our brief um, Mr. Durango's opinion was based upon self-serving statements by Mr. Christensen saying these houses were in very poor condition. 
we requested an inspection of the inside of the house and it was disallowed so based upon the objective uh, information that Mr. Uh, Roper looked at in terms of uh, market sales in that in that area, uh, his testimony was based on objective facts as opposed to the self-serving statements of Mr. Uh, I'm just actually asking you, what's your reading of the judgment? Did the ju did the trial court make a fact finding as to the reasonableness of the value that the trustee assigned? Your Honor, I, I quite I, I don't understand. Uh, her rationale on that. I think she just, she, she just, I, my understanding or my reading of her opinion is that Barbara Christensen had the exclusive sole discretion to set the value. She did that. Well, well that, that's what the judgment says, right? In, in, um, uh, under count four, um, that's, she says that, but then in the very next sentence, she says, then she sort of says, well, and she testified that she valued the properties based on her own broker opinion, factoring in all expenses, including those to transfer and sell the properties. Is that a finding? Do you read that in total as a finding that the assigned value was reasonable? And, it, and if it was reasonable, then there probably wasn't a breach of fiduciary duty, correct? At least as to that point. It, well, if, if, it, if certainly if it was a reasonable value with a trustee exercising her, her mandatory duty of good faith, which is not waivable under any trust document under 736, then yes, a, a reasonable value is a, is a trustee that has used her reasonable skills, and she was a real estate broker, who, who looked at the situation and said, this is a reasonable value. Let me but ask you this. So you have the judge that, I mean, this was a trial, and she heard the testimony from, from um, the appellee, and she heard the, serving as a trustee, and she heard the testimony um, of the appellant's experts and made a credibility determination on who to believe in this case. Um, given that determination by the trial court, aren't, aren't we left with the trial judge's uh, determination on credibility? I mean, we can't step well, in and say, okay, well, we think that this person really is the one you should have believed. We, we certainly don't have the authority to do that. Well, Your Honor, but it, it, it was apples and oranges. And I think that the, the basis for why the, uh, the, the, the trial court never adjudicated whether the underlying f assumptions that Mr. Durango undertook in his evaluation affected it, and clearly it did. He was told to assume the inside conditions of those homes to be in poor condition. After hundreds of thousands of dollars was expended by this trustee improving these properties, that's absurd. And therefore, uh, you know, I think that the well, counsel, reliance- Well, counsel, the trial court didn't accept the valuation of either expert. The, that's right. Correct. The trial court. The trial court. The trial court apparently rejected the, the valuations of both experts. That's correct. And in, and instead seemed to adopt the the valuation of the trustee. That's right. Based upon the market value. So my question is: is is that? Do you read that adoption of the trustee's valuation, which was below all of the experts' valuations? At, by at least eighty thousand. Um, yes. Well, let me ask this question: well, These eight properties were owned half by the trustee not correct not correct S six of the eight were owned 50 percent by barbara 50 percent by the trust two of the properties were owned 100 percent by the trust but your clients were disputing the sale price of the six no, no. What what happened here, Your Honor, is Thistle was sold. So in, right. in 2015, and that's not in dispute. No, that's not in dispute. Okay. It, it was sold for fair market value, okay. and we, we we wanted all the properties sold. They were told for 18 years, right. we will sell all these properties. Okay, but doesn't the fact that the trustee was unwilling to sell her interest in the property affect the value, the market value of that those properties? Well, Your Honor, there, there is, I, I don't recall the testimony that there was any other option explored. I, 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 there was no consideration of selling the other 100%. There was no consideration of, of um, was one the of the trustee, Was the trustee required to explore that? 
no your honor but other to the trustee had discretion in that regard correct the script the trustee had discretion but but absolute discretion with regard to setting the property value does not mean she can self deal this is a case of pure self dealing well counsel what if she was self dealing what let's assume for a moment that we agree this panel agrees that she self dealt by transferring the properties to herself and her son but what if at the same time the trial court found that the value she put on the properties was a reasonable market value but if if the then you don't have it you don't have a, an argument right at that point um, I I if she finds you no know, damages I'm sorry. You'd have no damages then, right? Oh no, no, no. still have damages because remember the the loss of the appreciation of the property is just a small part of the overall damages. The damages here total over uh, seven hundred and forty. How would you have damages as to the valuation of the properties if well, the trial court concluded that the properties received a fair market value? Um, it, there was no evidence for the trial court to conclude that the property uh, was properly valued other than the testimony of Barbara Christensen saying this is what the tax rolls say. Even their own expert said that the true market value was $80,000 under. Our expert, of course, was 240000 under. Um, I think that whether the value was, was reasonable has to go hand in hand with whether there was um, a abuse of discretion and so your point is that even if the trial court even if we read the trial courts judgment as making a finding that the valuations were reasonable that you would you would you're saying look there was no competent evidence to support that finding is that your what you're saying to us that's right be, that, that's right because it was solely based upon um, uh, Barbara Christensen's uh, testimony that she used the um, the uh, the rent rolls. Oh, I'm Bar sorry. Was the, Barbara Christensen offer, offered as an expert witness? No, she was not. And when their own expert admits that the market value was understated by at least eighty thousand dollars, there is no competent substantial evidence. I think that's going to support that. Um, well, had goes, she been had she been offered as an expert and provided her own opinion, then then there would be correct. You can see it in that if she were offered as an expert and she gave her her opinion as a broker then then that would be substantial competent evidence well, correct? There, there would be evidence but I think when you look at that testimony coupled with the 18 years of cooking the books of under reporting um, the rent rolls by the trial court I mean the trial court ruled against you on those points well the trial court did but there but there was not competent substantial evidence to support a finding that there was clear and distinct record-keeping this was the uh, are you was, suggesting there was no evidence to support the trial courts finding I'm I'm su I'm suggesting that the, the competent and substantial evidence overwhelmingly showed that this was the perfect storm of terrible that's not that we're not we're not, our job isn't to reweigh the evidence though right that's true. It's not the, the trial court or not the appellate court's duty to, to reweigh the evidence. But when you look at the testimony offered, there, the, the other side never retained an accountant. The other side Let never could explain. This. Let me yes. ask you this because we, I think there's no dispute over the fact that the, the trust document says that the trustee can value within her, the properties within her discretion. Back in, apparently back in 1997, when she took over the, the trust, she used her opinion to value the rental properties. No, she? no, she didn't. She, she didn't? hired an independent broker. And that's what our beneficiaries thought she was going to do when she terminated the trust. And that's why there's such... Okay, did they, did they, was there any evidence that when she terminated the trust and she, um, she indicated the way she was going to value the properties. Was there any objection? Did they say, hey, wait a minute, we think you should hire A, B, and C to get They were, um, uh, Judge Berger, they weren't given an opportunity other than they were given the final report saying this is what you're going to get after 18 years, here's your $20,000. The letter said, uh, the letter told them that she was going to value the properties based on, if I recall correctly, correct, maybe I'm wrong. I've done a lot of reading in the last week, correct me if I'm wrong, but the letter said we're going to value the properties based on the quote current assessment. That, Isn't that what the letter said? That, that's exactly right. It and didn't our, say the property appraiser's no, assessment, right? No, it, it didn't. It, it we said were, it just said quote 
current the current assessment. Current assessment. And given that she hired an independent broker in 1997, which she testified to was the best way of, of assessing the value. So her testimony in this case was, that was the best way I thought to assess the value of the property. Why would that change? The only reason it would change is because she had misled the beneficiaries that they were going to reap the profits of all of the capital improvements and repairs and when all the properties were sold at the end of the trust administration all the boats would rise she changed the game shortly before she terminated after they spent over two hundred and forty thousand right in the last few years she she turned the she changed the game and said you know what i'm going to distribute i'm only going to sell thistle i'm going to uh, distribute out uh, your value based upon not an independent broker, but what I deem it to be based upon the well, your, your clients tax knew, rules. Your clients knew that she wasn't going to sell the other properties. That much is clear, right? No, Your Honor, that's not clear. Well, when she said we're going to value them based on the current assessments, what, what else would that mean? Well, Your Honor, understand that as a result of this, uh, of this uh, termination, we filed suit, so they did object. When, when they got this, and they saw that she was only going to uh, she was going to lowball the value of the property, uh, uh, transfer for um, all of them except for one to her and her son. They filed suit. Yeah, but she but she initially the evidence shows she initially purchased these properties, um, right, and then so that her mother could have basically an income. Correct? She she well the the testimony is a little unclear on that. I think she did say she purchased some of the properties, but. Regardless, there's, it, it, there's no dispute that the trust um, uh, owned half of half for up, the properties, owned, right? But, but from initially it, before the, the trust was the, even instituted, she was 50% owner and was maintaining all of those properties and letting mom or mom and dad at the time, um, you know, have, have the rent, rental income. Right. When mom was alive between 1997 and, and when, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, between 1994 and 1997, all the rent went to mom. But once mom died, this trust became irrevocable. Her sole duties were, were to the remainder beneficiaries. And the, the, the fact that, th that she, for 18 years, did not make one single distribution of income and not one- The court found there was no income. No, yeah. There wasn't any income because of the improper accounting. All well, the trial court disagreed with that. Isn't that, isn't that a factual the, the, issue? You know, uh, Judge, it, it, it is a factual issue if there's competent and substantial evidence to support her findings. Counsel, you're into your rebuttal time. I'm sorry. Uh, you want to keep going? or? Uh, no, I'd like to reserve. Okay. You have three minutes and 46 seconds. On behalf of the defendants, Barbara Christensen, Dale Christensen, um, as trustees. Council, was the valuation based upon the property uh, tax assessment or upon your client, uh, the trustee's uh, opinion as a broker? Partially both. The testimony was that she used all of those things in consideration of the numbers. In fact, well, the are you referring to page 874, 873, 874, where she testified that, yeah, I, we, they talked about the fact that she disclosed she was going to use the current assessment. Um, and then she testified that she looked at, some, quote, some comps and that it looked close to the assessment. Yes, sir. There was that testimony that you're referring to right there. there is there anything else that we could look at and say is her opinion as a broker? Because that, I don't know if that gets you there. There was testimony that she, the one that she was a, a broker and that she offered her opinion and to. Well, she didn't ever, I, look, I haven't found a place in the record where she offered her opinion as a broker on the value of the properties. If you could point me to that, it would said, be helpful. When she said that she established the values, she did it in such a way which was not objected to. It was an opinion by Barbara Christensen based on her being a broker, based on her review of the comps, based on the uh, property appraisers' assessments, based on the fact that they were rental properties, based on the fact that the various states of repair, based on her knowledge, intimate knowledge of the properties, and also the valuing of the properties as a whole. One of the problems with- D Didn't she testify that when she, quote, looked at some comps, that it was, quote, close yes, sir, to the property prices? That was, that was, that was is, part is, of her testimony. Is that what you say is her broker's opinion on valuation? That's a, a part of it. That's part of what brokers do is they study the comps. At what point did she say, I'm a broker, 
here's what I did, and here's how much of the properties were worth. It based wasn't, on, it she wasn't didn't. that succinct. She didn't say it. Did, it. You would have to parcel together the different po points she of used, testimony. She used my reading from the, of the record. She used the property appraiser's assessments to value the properties. Yes, Do you sir, disagree with that? Including, no, that's part of what she used. And if you, like, if you look no, no, at No, 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 counsel. Okay. Well, the way I read it, she used that, but justified it by saying that she looked at some comps and it was close. And so, therefore, she was saying, look, it was fine. I, I think that that's one way to interpret the testimony. I think that the court interpreted it another way. In the final judgment, it mentioned that she considered those other factors. When she took over in 1997, did she use a, uh, somebody other than herself to value the properties? She used a broker's opinion. Why did she not use someone else she to told, value? She told the, because by that time, she had a lot more experience as a broker. This was some 20 years later. And she told all the beneficiaries in 2014 what she was going to do, and nobody objected. So that was a year went by before she did it. So the court's question. Well, she said in the letter, current assessment. I don't, I don't know. That, that's, that's, that's a little bit more vague than saying I'm going to use the property appraiser's current assessment, right? I don't, what other current assessment is there? Well, I, you know, I don't know. Current I mean, a, a layperson might think a current assessment is a, a broker's opinion. We have to take into consideration a couple of things. One, that this is a family dynamic. Everybody knows each other very well. She's quite familiar with the, the knowledge and understanding of her family members and what she was relaying to them it was what she was going to do and nobody objected. Further, we go back to the trust and the trust document says that she's the trustee values the property and it cannot be challenged. Well, counsel, I'm glad you brought that up because the statute says you can't waive the duty of good faith, right? Correct. So in valuing the properties, could she have valued every property at $1 in her discretion? I think that that would be a f question of fact for the finder of fact. No, 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 no. Whether or not she, I, I believe that's clearly bad faith. Okay, so she can't violate the duty of good faith when she values the properties, correct? Correct. Did the trial court find that she did not value her, uh, did not violate her duty of good faith when she valued the properties? Is that finding made by the trial court? I don't believe that that specific language is in there. Well, I mean, I mean, is that essentially what the trial court was doing when it ruled on, and this is not a trick question. Uh, there, there's two sentences in here that sort of really get to the core of this issue, I think. Yes, sir. One of them seems to indicate that the trial court just accepted her valuation just because she had discretion without considering whether or not the duty of good faith was violated. Then you look at the second sentence where it basic, the court basically says, she testified X, Y, and Z. Yes, sir. Which isn't the same thing as saying, and I believe it, or I find this to be reasonable, right? But maybe you could imply that when you put the two together. Can you help me out there? I mean, because I think that if the trial court made a finding that based upon the evidence that this was reasonable value, right? Then at that point, the issue's kind of moot. I believe that... As long as there's a reasonable explanation or there, there's, the, there's some reasonable basis upon which the court finds something, there's no requirement that they dot every single I and every single T and rebut every That's the question. Argument. Is, what is that? Is that a finding of reasonableness or is that just simply a conclusion that based on the trust documents, the trustee has discretion, therefore the issue's over? I believe it's a finding of reasonableness and discretion. It's both. It's, if you look at everything, I think that she's finding one... What was interesting in plaintiff's case is they never once talked about the trust itself, never argued the trust. They just ignored all of the language of the trust, which is significant because there are a lot of things in there that are beneficial to my client. And when the court rendered its decision, listened to all of the evidence, it mentions the trust. The court looked at the trust. The court read the trust. And it also addresses certain points of reasonableness that were, I think, to cover the fact that Yes, while she has absolute discretion, the law is clear that absolute discretion does not mean you can just do anything you want. That's true, as long as it's reasonable. And the court is giving reasons for her findings. And, if, and, and going back and looking at the testimony and looking at the way that it was presented on, on all of the points, whether it's the, the appraisers, their own appraiser, the plaintiff's appraiser said that you had to, you had to um, value these houses each one by one, standing on its own, and then add all of those up. But then said that the uh, that the proper way to do something like this 
is to, do, to put them all together and value them, as a value them as a bundle because that's the way they are presented. They're part of one trust. They are the, the race of a single trust, so you don't do it individually. He actually testified on the record that he did it incorrectly. And when Durango did it, he, he put them together and he valued them as bulk. When she valued them, she valued them as bulk. That was the testimony. There was a lot of testimony. There was things that, the way that they would present things and twist things and the way that we were talking about saying that there's no accurate records, that is just has was blown it, my mind throughout this entire case. Counsel, the trustee was not offered as an expert witness, correct? That's correct. Okay. Her opinion was, was submitted to the court without objection. And so her opinion came in to evidence and the court accepted it. Is there any evidence that the valuation of these properties were valued below the assessment? No, ma'am. There, there was, I, or I don't recall. They, they were valued. I, I, I do not believe that. Were, 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 doesn't the record reflect they were valued consistent with the property appraiser's tax assessment? Is that correct? I believe that is. But not below the tax assessment. That's, that's what I recall. And so, I, and I don't know that answer specifically. There may be an instance where I could be wrong. I don't remember every single line of, of testimony, but I do believe what you just said is correct. Okay. If the court has no further questions, I would like to just add, because I have a couple minutes left. The, um, the, the records, and you folks didn't get to see it, the, they were meticulous records. And so every single property came in, like every single property for every single year had its own, had all of its receipts, had all of the rolls, every dime. That yeah, came I mean, she, they, they didn't write on the receipt, hey, this is for property A. But, but they took the receipt, and they put it in a file for property A, yes, right? Sir. And then at the end of the year, put them all together. And what happened, and why there was so much problem, and with Carol Felsing, I felt bad for her on cross-examination, all the things that she got wrong. She couldn't get basic math correct. She would never admit her mistakes, tens of thousands of dollars of mathematical errors, and she just would not admit it when it was just, it's math. How can you not admit that? And the court, trial court discounted her testimony. Correct? Absolutely. And it was, it was, it was bad. As far as like as expert testimony goes, that was bad. And it was just, and you always say to all of your witnesses on the scene, never, never deny the obvious. If it's obvious, admit it. And she just, and she was just wrong left and right. She talked about her failure to understand the accounting because when they went and they made copies of everything, we made everything available. Dale Christensen offered, you need to let me show you, stop taking them out of the bags because you're, you're not gonna understand it. Once you take it out of the bag and you just stack it up, in, in reams and reams and reams, thousands of documents, you don't know which receipt went with which property. I agree with that because that's not how it was set up. But when you came in and we showed pictures and we introduced all of them into evidence, we showed pictures of them and introduced a few of them because it was just tons of paper. But you had a bag for every property. So you had every year, you had 1997. Here's eight different bags. Here's each property. Here's all the receipts for each property. There's a list of, of every dime that was spent, every dime that was collected, and that's all inside the bag. So all you have to do is go to that bag, pull it out, and it was very orderly. And when, in Dale Christensen's deposition, they asked him, well, if it's so orderly, then find me some, in, in 2008, the insurance payment for Xenia or whatever it was. And he just, he went straight to the bag, pulled it out and bam, and it was like immediately. And so it's like, because it, it was incredibly well put together. It's not how an accountant would do it. And when they t came and took the time to, t to make all the copies and, and shake everything out, I was there. I was there while it was going on. Uh, Mr. Douglas was not there. They had another attorney from their firm there. They had all the copy people. Dale Christensen was there. And we were telling them, if you guys, if you guys pull them out the way that you're doing it, you're just mixing everything up and you're not going to understand it. Let us spend the time to, to come in and talk to you guys. I offered to Mr. Douglas at least five times, come and when they first filed suit, saying that we don't understand the accounting. They, they offered to show them the accounting all the time. Well, is any of this in the record? Um, <laughs> no, I'm just talking about it. The pictures of all the, the evidence is, it's, uh, and I think that probably the argument is certainly in the transcript about the argument and the evidence. It's just but, that, but nevertheless, counsel, I mean, it, th these are fact issues, right? I mean, yes, sir. It's all, and, it, and the trial court made its decision, and, and it's not for this court to reweigh that the, the testimony and, and agree with some other witness, right? Agreed, sir. We, we don't see the witnesses testify. We can't judge their credibility from the appellate bench. Yes, sir. I believe the bulk of the things that were raised certainly by the court's questions are all dealing with uh, 
the uh, questions of fact, which would all be a competent, substantial evidence standard and abuse of discretion on that sort of thing. The, uh, I don't know that there's any real issues about the statutory interpretation, which would be a de novo review. So I don't really see that. And I, I would hope if there is any question about that, I think that their interpretation of what the requirement is for uh, producing accountings is pretty well covered in my answer brief with regard to the proper way which I believe that a statute should be interpreted the way it is written and uh, lawyers and courts should not read into things that aren't there, respectfully. Are there any other questions? Judge, it's good to see you. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. Okay, and in rebuttal, you have three minutes and 46 seconds, whenever you're ready. Your, your Honor, since Mr. Uh, Chase uh, gave his opinion about Carol Felsing, I have to say that she did an outstanding job with her testimony. She has 30 years experience as a, an accountant and has served as a trustee for numerous time. But the, the trial court chose to disregard her testimony. Yes, Your Honor, and, but, but we believe arbitrarily so. Her testimony was unrebutted with regard to the conclusions she Were reached. Were there accounting errors? I mean, were there like math? There was errors? one math error with regard to um, Anthony Aramedia, uh, which we noted in the in the um, in the brief. Uh, payments, secret payments, were made to him eighty thousand dollars. This is a case of underreporting of rent by eighty thousand dollars that were made to Anthony Aramedia who is a, a roommate and close personal friend of Dale Christensen that Barbara Christensen hired to manage these properties. He's a handyman, right? I guess, Your Honor. I think that may be right. Uh, $80,000 to handyman is a pretty good amount. Isn't there testimony that the, what he charged for his services was less than the going rate? Your Honor, there was, yes, that was totally self-serving by Dale Christensen and himself. They had absolutely no records of the time he spent. In the Traub case... Well, did they need records of the time he spent for it to be competent evidence, the testimony? Yes. In Traub, where a trustee has the burden, like in here, to keep clear and accurate records, the, the Traub case found that oral testimony was insufficient to meet the burden of the trustee to keep the records. This but is if, the, if the testimony was like that the going rate, I don't know what his was, I can't remember, 30 something an hour or whatever, and the, and the typically people would charge 50, that in the end they, the estate or the trust was charged well below what the going rate was, and therefore, I mean, how, if, even if there was error, how could it be harmful? But, Your, Your Honor, there's absolutely no documentation to support this. This just came out of thin air. And this is why trustees are obligated in the state of Florida to keep clear, distinct records. This case really is about... They have to keep a record for every nut and bolt. Your Honor, I think that, have, I think, I think nut and bolt was used in, no, in, in the answer yes. brief. They so. have to keep a receipt and a record for every expenditure, every deposit. And under 736... So sometimes you go to Lowe's, right, and you get the, yeah. the little screw that you need. Correct. Um, and, you, and you search for it forever, yeah. but you find it, and it's literally two cents, right? So you got it. So over 30 years of a trust, mm -hmm. they got to keep every two cent receipt for a little screw? The, the statute says transactions. Well, and, I, but and, I, and, and so, but yes or no, that's your interpretation of the statute? Transactions. If you, if you paid, if you have, if you paid uh, $5 as an expenditure and wrote a check about for two that, cents for a screw. Or two cents, yes, you're supposed to account for that. You're supposed to document that. But, but that's not how it works in reality. In reality, you pay the, you pay the contractor $5,000. You make that, as, that's a transaction that you note on your trust accounting. And you have a date. And do you keep the contractor's hours? Do you keep records of the contractor's you, hours you as well? Keep, you, you, well keep the, you, you keep the invoice that the contractor sent you saying, you owe me $5,000. That's right. what you keep. But do you keep the hours? Because you're saying that they needed to keep the hours. Your Honor, I think in a case where you have, uh, when you have someone who is commingled money and is hi uh, hiding the fact that you're paying um, your roommate money to manage and you're skimming rents off of the collection, no one knew that the rents were under-reported by at least $80,000. If we had a clear, concise um, report that complies with 736-08135, these, these beneficiaries would have known all this. And the statute doesn't even begin to run until you have a proper trust accounting. And that was recently changed last year. Council, um, you're out of time. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Honor. The court is in recess.